You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. Episode 34, our holiday episode of Storyteller Conclave, a show about helping you run the best tabletop role-playing game you can. Whether you're a new storyteller or a dungeon master learning the craft, or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Rob. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Yeah, we're going to stick to that, just so you know, because <laughs> we don't have the time to go through every D&D god's holiday Oh, they God, I know. or or our own. <laughs> still a bunch of a uh, bunch of BS going on between Mistra and 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 Helm and Blood for the Blood God. Yeah, we're just gonna leave it at that. Skulls for the Skull Throne. There we go. There we go. But today isn't about that. No, today is about generosity and hope and gift giving and yeah. holidays in general and the celebrations and yeah, like how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> like I've been in a couple games where holidays were important. Holidays? What's that all about? <laughs> I mean, it, it's not really brought up in games a lot, or even in stories in general. No, I mean, isn't. let me put it to the side. TNT has their thing. AMC has their thing. Mm-hmm. You know, get the couple together who d- shouldn't belong together, right? And right. make it kind of mm-hmm. weird, and then make one of them have to go home. <laughs> you know, or back to what they were doing and then make them quickly return so that because you could have an ending. they realized they couldn't live without the other person. Yeah. I, I know we're going to get another Christmas Prince thing yep. again this year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Hallmark. Never change. So much Hallmark. we know you never will. Nope. Nope. It's, hey, they, they know their crowd. They know their crowd. They do. So in that, do do we have anything in regards to this? Like, is it ever really brought up? Is it really discussed? Um, I mean, we we did uh, we did a whole bunch of uh, talking about world building a handful of episodes back. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of those one of those bits of world building was about societies and such like that, mm-hmm. and some about religions and whatnot. That is true. And uh, yeah, I think I think uh, holidays are a great way uh, to kind of add a lot of that great world building because it's kind of a, a nice mix of like how a society celebrates things. It doesn't even have to be a religious thing. You no, know. but I, um, I think also in the hope and generosity of it, yeah. we always see in stories like uh, – have I don't know if you've seen Shrek the Halls, which was their Christmas <laughs> version of Shrek. I, I have not. I thought it was very funny that they used it – they used the stress and the feel – of how everyone else was. So mm-hmm. it kind of goes back to our setting thing where like the environment can affect people. Like imagine it's a holiday, a high holiday in your game, and suddenly all of the stores are stripped bare. No oh. one wants to work. Oh. There's ice and snow everywhere. Oh. Yeah. So- suddenly it's real. Like now holidays are a thing. It's uh, it's it's actually worth noting that like Elder Scrolls Online mm-hmm. uh, actually has their the, what they call their Black Free Dust yeah! sale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, D and D Online did that as well because yeah. uh, yeah. I remember them doing the holiday events there, where mm-hmm. it's like you know you could collect things. I mean, Ark does it in its game. Yeah. I think holiday things are a thing, but. I think sometimes it's missed that it is stressful to get to the goal. Oh, it is. You know, it is absolutely. Yeah, there's there's because I mean, there's a lot of obligations that come with holidays. Yeah, um, I know pageantry. Per, I mean, per, personally, even outside of games, right? Uh, I I feel a lot of stress around the holidays. Oh like, God, yeah. Gift giving is uh, personally not one of my my favorite things in the world. Not because I don't like giving gifts to other people. I love it. Yeah. I hate the stress of coming up with a gift for other oh, God, people, yeah. and then the social expectations that it is a good gift and that you will like it. Yes. And what if you don't? And then right. I look like a fool. Yep. And uh, but, yeah, but that but. is real world stuff. But That's correct. <laughs> but I think it also has a mm-hmm. mark on some of the things in games and and about. Gift giving and generosity in general is how do you know when it's generous or not? Like we we talk about like 
when you're done with something, when you become the hero of a portion of a story, there's a certain amount of generosity given, a certain amount of respect and sure. probably a monetary bit of generosity that is turned in at the end. Yeah, OK. Spoil, you know? Spoils of war, yeah. reward reward for your, uh, for your right. deeds, your toils. I mean D&D kind of has a framework for how much effort equals how much generosity. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes that can be uh, lost as well on the – uh, players in the sense that you can often have situations where um, the thing that is being given is worth more than the value of currency. Mm, yeah. You know, whether it is you have a boon or you have the favor of or I'm going to give you access to something. Sure. And sure. now – that might have – like for instance, if if the whole point of getting this done was to hope that this guy would give you access to his library so that you could look up a map that no one else has access to, mm -hmm. I mean that's that's something. Yeah. I mean some movies, heist movies tend to do that – like they do an initial heist to get something to give to somebody to do a bigger heist. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's a it's a gateway heist, if you will. You know. So one of one of the one of the best episodes of Deep Space Nine actually was was exactly that. And it was they uh, they wanted a baseball card for uh, for Captain Cisco. Oh God! And uh, so they said, okay, well we want to buy this. And I'm like, well you don't have an, you don't you don't have the gold press latinum for that. Okay, well how do we get gold press latinum? Well, let's talk to Quark because he deals with money all like, right. like that all the time. Well, right. what does what does Quark want? Well, Quark says go talk to his brother. His brother needs this thing fixed, but they need a special tool to fix it. Right. With another per and, and it's just this Rube Goldberg machine of yep. uh, do us a favor though, and yeah. it's just you know, which is a great yeah. story. Pl again, that's a whole chain of plots mm -hmm. that eventually get you back to the main story. Yeah, which I think is beautiful. I, I think that kind of stuff <laughs> is fun. I think it can add a lot of flavor, but it, it's little bits of generosity. Yeah, you know, yeah. or like the white elephant trade up, you know, right, kind of a thing right. where I'm going to trade you this and this to get that, which will then get me this, which will then get me that. Sure, and sure. this plus this then will get me that final thing, which is what I really wanted in the first place. And I mean, you might you might call it you know motivated by greed because of course you know you're trying to get a get a, a, a you know a reward out of it at the end of the day. But right, um, you know I think especially like if you're if you're running a real you know uh, a real goody two shoes sort of. Uh, uh, sort of campaign, you know, mm -hmm. where all your your characters do have the best interest of those in mind. Right. You know, it can be actually very fulfilling mm -hmm. um, to run stories where you know you are doing stuff out of the kindness of your own heart. You know, the 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 quest is being fulfilled for no other reason than that villager was like, oh, I really wish I had that. Right. And you're like, you know, that might actually be in my power to get. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of times that. Um, we step into games and I, I remember Earl and Steve telling me about a, a game where they rescued a little girl from a well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then literally got her into Wizards College. Uh-huh. <laughs> And put her up from there. And then continued to check yeah. back on her every time they were in the neck of the woods. going like, how is she doing? Does yeah. she need anything? Does she need new books? Right. Does she need parchment or anything? We we recently came into a treasure. Like, we can afford this. Don't worry about us. Like, yeah. we want nothing but the best for this little girl. She's had a, she's had a rough go of things. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And turning those things around. And I think that kind of generosity – is different because mm -hmm. it's it's not a calculatable end that like something like D and D would naturally have. Yeah, sure, it's it's not it's not treasure for challenge rating, right? You know, you know, it's a it's a future, it's an investment. Yeah, and I think those kind of investments should be valued in games. And I think as a storyteller, if you could make notes about those things, you can make those investments have future value. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you you talk a lot uh, as a seventh C uh, storyteller mm -hmm. um, about the value of reputation. It's huge. And, uh, you know, so forging those bonds and stuff like that and mm -hmm. keeping track of those NPCs. Uh, I know last episode we answered a, a question from Technolich, one of the, uh, one of our Patreon supporters, mm -hmm. um, asking, uh, you know, what, what to do with, with NPCs who have fulfilled their duty in the, uh, in, yeah. in, in the plot. And the answer was pretty much you, you keep them around. Yeah. You always keep them because especially if you have fulfilled their plot. You know, assuming they've had a they've had a good resolution. Yeah, these are people out in the world now that you've established. And they're 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 characters in your story that have a favorable outlook on your party. Yeah, and those can be used to con to 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 continue plot lines. Yeah, they can be used to return favors. Well, and you know, if the if the party is in a rough spot, 
Oh yeah, they, they may they may be the stranger that the, the Deus Ex Machina sort of you know swoops out of nowhere and saves their bacon because you know exactly I saw you guys were going this way and I thought maybe you might need a little help. I'm glad I came along because yeah, you need someone to get that key that's just out of reach. Or you know? the one that got me was somebody had used uh, they had uh, companions mm-hmm. uh, that like you know you had a knight who had a squire, you had a wizard who had an assistant. Um, there was uh, uh, they had a, a bard following them as well because they had purchased you know through some means or acquired them, and uh, the DM was very obvious that like at a certain point they're going to leave your party. Why? Mm-hmm. Because they're no longer followers, they're adventurers, and they have lives. Oh wow! And yeah. so uh, many, many, can- many uh, episodes later, when they eventually got, they were deep into a scenario. They literally came back to one of the major towns mm-hmm. uh, haphazardly, went to go see one of the dukes, and opening the door uh, was a butler, and behind them was the seneschal. The wizard's apprentice. Oh wow! And she saw them and had to stay, you know, proper because you know where she was. But the moment she could break, she was like, "It's so good to see you." These are the things that happened in my life. Yeah, I've been look doing at, really look well. Look at me now. I'm the seneschal of this hall. Exactly. And, yeah. and they had an insider person that they never even thought about. That's great. Because they thought they were going to go into it like, "Oh crap, we're going to have to dump a bunch of money and we're going to bribe this guy and blah blah blah." To mm-hmm. But no, they they didn't have to do any of that. The storyteller just made a note saying like this is where this person ended up. Exactly. And and it's all because they nurtured that, you yeah. know. And and there was another one where they didn't take out a thieves guilt. They understood what was going on with mm-hmm. it. And because the storyteller was working was watching for that, they were like, Okay, you know, you guys, you know, this is the person in your group who was really steering you guys the wrong way and getting you guys close to you you were just originally petty kid thieves who were trying to make ends meet. Yeah, yeah. Because you're all a bunch of beggars and such. You know, that shit happens. Like I'm an adventurer, I'll go and get money my way. Sure. This is the way you're trying to live. No disrespect. Sure. You know, but this guy was trying to get you guys to go become an assassin's guild, mm-hmm. basically, without the guild part. Just you're doing bad jobs. Jobs for bad people. Straight up wet work, yeah. And they were just like, you recognize that that wasn't what you wanted to do. And the moment that he wanted you guys to kill us and defend him, you routed. And they were like, yeah, we we, we weren't about to get into that. Mm-hmm. So we let the players let them go, captured the one guy, one of the kids who had not been recognized as a one of the thieves, stepped forward, said he did do thief work with him and took the fall. But also said that he had murdered and so they spoke up for him and said, no, 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 he did not do the murder. We saw this guy do the murder. This kid should be you know, let go and they, they put him in jail for a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. They paid off the fine for the kid and he was able to be let go. Let that all go to the side. Again, many episodes later, they were in a bind uh-huh. and sure enough, out of the woodwork comes these kids who are now guards. They started working. Yep. To make their money because the one guard saw that the other kid had come forward and risked himself and those guards were like, hey, while you're here, maybe you're not in your cell the whole time. Maybe you're helping us clean the cells and do these other things and mm-hmm. we'll pay you. And so by the time he actually left his time, he did those things because he was doing the – you know, he felt that that was a better job, taught the other kids. They realized their follies. They became friends with the guards, became guards themselves. So now mm-hmm. – they're working with the guards. So when these adventurers show up and are suddenly in a bind down by the docks, there's all these kids and they're like, yeah, they're not a problem. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to turn a blind eye to everything that's happened on the docks tonight while you're beating the crap. And they're like, oh, crap. Now we have six guards to deal with in this fight. We're going to get roughed up by the town and there's going to be problems. And literally one of the guys comes up, brings up a torch, looks at them. They recognize his eyes and he just goes. Nothing to see here and just turns and walks his whole group of guards <laughs> away and that they just continue beautiful. pummeling the bad guys that at that point. That is beautiful. So I thought – but those are the kinds of things, those different ways of generosity. Yeah. You know, of just giving a minor blind eye because you did the right thing. I'm uh, I'm actually reminded of uh, uh, you guys in my game mm-hmm. um, went up to uh, investigate some banditry in the, uh, in the Northern Highlands. Mm-hmm. And uh, in your first encounter, you know, they were standing out in the middle of the road, prepared to give you the yeah. big speech about, yep. uh, you know, hey, you know, you're, there's going to be a tax to pass through here. Pay us this much and we won't rough you up for it. Right. 
and uh, immediately there was a there was a fight that broke out. Yep. Um, but what the the important part was is that you essentially tried to uh, intimidate them down, mm-hmm. and even the one person that was pretty badly wounded, yeah. Um, once they relented. Uh, was given a, he- a healing potion. Yep. Like basically sat down next to them, going like, "Okay, you you good?" Yeah. Like, and there was there was a talk, mm-hmm. and they they saw that you were at least merciful, if mm-hmm. not on the same side, definitely right. definitely opposition, but that you could be trusted to treat them at least like people with mm-hmm. lives that mattered. Yeah. And um, at a later encounter when you were forced to go to their lair. Yeah. Um. <laughs> they were willing to negotiate with you, yeah. and you actually turned what was supposed to be a large combat encounter into a talking encounter, Complete. in spite of the fool hole, foolhardy asshole part. <laughs> First off, he was being himself. Oh which no, was no, 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 gorgeous! No, no. no, it was an amazing scene. I yeah. am not saying no. Yeah. The bard, the character, yes, yes, the character was being an asshole yes. like that character. Does so beautiful. because he is that character. He is that as a noble. I, I've I have rarely seen someone play a noble like a rich, mm-hmm. well-to-do. I know what I'm doing. Attitude noble all the time. Yep, and he does such a snarky, fantastic job of it oh, that I'm the. It, it catches me off guard. Uh-huh. Like I don't quite know how to feel about it until we're in it <laughs> but the best part is that right next to me is steve laughing his ass off and clapping every yep. time because he's loving every moment of yep. it and then i it turns my brain from uh my character back to rob who's back to enjoying the scene and what just happened yes you know yes. that it's fun and that it's that we're enjoying <laughs> this and it's like dear god this is fantastic and i Haven't smile any of you fools heard of a warning shot <laughs> First off, the answer is no. No. No one's heard of that in these damn woods. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So. Uh, but but like I said, I mean, the, yeah. the, the point is, though, is that because you were – you showed generosity, you showed yeah. compassion to these people. You know, you turned – you you then later, like like a whole um, you know episode or two later, turned what was supposed to be a big knockdown drag out fight into, into a talking guitar. Yeah. You, you negotiated with them. Mm-hmm. They gave you a little bit of their spoils back. Yeah. You gave them a valuable bottle of wine. Yeah. As a show of good faith, and yep. you walked away from there, not yep. a shot fired, except for the warning shot. No, which didn't <laughs> hurt anybody. So that's a good. Which news. didn't hurt anybody. But to speak to that, it's part of the storyteller following falling in love with the characters. Yeah, and you could have forced it. You could have made that situation <laughs> turn very easily. Sure, but you didn't. And I think that showed uh, some they, generosity. They, they did put a couple crossbow bolts into him, come to think. The, well, yeah, we took care of that, though. I let him bleed for a little while. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a but little bit. that's where things like that giving, uh, you know, to adventurers become, starts to become a question of what do you give? Now, again, like I was saying, D&D kind of has outlines for it. Yeah, sure. Of what a gift really is and the weight of said gifting at the end of an encounter, you know, of what your spoils are. Uh-huh. But like, what, what is beyond that? Like, does it make sense to, to give something more than that? When is it, when are you pushing beyond a certain envelope? And I know that there are favoritism mm-hmm. to like, 7th C uses drama dice mm-hmm. and that is definitely a gift uh, as you're uh, – for good role playing and I tend to throw that when the table is enjoying itself. I will throw drama dice at people who oh, are sure. doing the right thing sure. to keep the story going you know, um, and to keep it light and fun. And crack up the whole table with a witty right. move. You get a right. drama die for or, it. Or, or, yeah. or, or thinking of something exceptionally witty uh-huh. You know, at just the right time to make an action happen or doing something that is 100 percent your character and and drawing that kind of that kind of line. I think that it does a good job of that. But are there are there other good things and is too much too much? Is it when does it unbalance at that point? Like and what do you do and what do you do if you how do, do you, off balance? Yeah, like yeah. how do you how do you bring it back to reality? Um, I mean, like you said, I, I, we, we, we've. Uh, you know, D and D, D and D kind of ha- kind of has a structure for it, yeah. but but I would say that structure is pretty open. Like there are suggested guidelines between wide margins of levels that your treasure should more or less have this 
value to it. Right. Um, I mean Sam brought up like how do you handle currencies in different areas, whether it's disparaging or not. Yeah. I think sometimes that has a huge leverage on it. Mm-hmm. I mean you go to some place that is a, a merchant city where taxes are collected on everything and they're probably going to be quite a bit of money and quite a lot of money changing hands. You can mm-hmm. probably find what you need. On the other hand, if you take care of a problem for a lord who's lord over a bunch of farmers, y- yeah, you got a bunch of money but it's pretty much useless. Yeah. Like yeah. that may be all he has and now you have something useless. Maybe you don't want the money. Right, right. You want something else. Well, yeah, there's definitely value in a lot of things like that. Um, like out in the Highlands where you guys are right now in my yeah. campaign, uh, you know, it's it's all backwoods villages. Yeah. With, you know, triple digit at most populations. Yeah. If they even reach the triple digits. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, if you guys walked out there and was like, well, you know, we've got a big stack of gold, they're like, we can't spend any of that. Right. Where the, where the hell are we going to spend, you know, 5,000 gold? What I need is sheep, you mm-hmm. know? What I need is cloth right now. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a tailor and my supplies are running, running low and the bandits have been picking off the supplies. And so what, what do I make my stock out of, you know? Right. I, I, I can't do anything with that because I can't get to a major town to buy the stuff. Right. You know? So if you want to take two days and take me to a town for free and bring me back with a whole stock of stuff, there's some value. Right. Right. You exactly. Know? So, you know, you, you want to think about the economy. Yeah, and, and how much and you're affecting you are. it, and and also you know if you, if you are looking to give rewards for for service or whatnot to uh, to your players, that's what's available. Mm-hmm. You know that 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 same tailor is not going to be able to offer, you know, hey, if you go, uh, I don't know, whatever, kill these goblins, you know, uh, down the road for me or whatever, uh, you know, I can't pay you. Right. I don't have two nickels to rub together. What I do have is three bolts of fine cloth, or I can make some new some new clothes for you, right? That will make you look, you know, noble, right? Or something like that. Some some intangible benefit, you, you know, know, that that's maybe a value. I mean, it's interesting to see what we consider in our heads the canon kind of thing, sure, sure, um, of D and D, and yet it doesn't necessarily fit with our stories, like Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. They went to the elves, mm-hmm. you know, of uh, of Mirkwood, or not Mirkwood, of uh, shit. No, I'm terrible. Oh, don't look at me. I'm yeah. not. I'm not um, the Lord of the Rings aficionado. Yeah, but uh, the Light of Alandria was mm-hmm. one of yeah. the things that was yeah. given. It wasn't money, but it was a powerful artifact mm-hmm. that was exceptionally important to the story. Later, you know, cloaks that could hide them, you know. Magical cloaks of uh, uh, to, that could hide them that would be heavily durable. Mm-hmm. You know, these types of things are simple magical items, but they have a value that is beyond what they are. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that is what is some of the things that are lost in the good things to give players mm-hmm. are those simple things. You know, a single item or a single thing that that might be important, like that tailor. Maybe he has one cloak of elven step that he's had from his father and he's he's kept it, you know, because his dad was a really good hunter. Yeah. And he's like, you know, I, I may not be able to give you much, but I've got this. And now this is a relic. Mm-hmm. You know, this is this is rare. You know, the elves don't give this out. So however they got it, they got it from this guy. And maybe later on the story, more than just the fact that they have this cloak and they can use it to do, you know, Step of the Wild or something like that with it. But when they go into the elven lands and the hunting group comes upon them, they recognize it. Yeah, they're like, you guys are wearing our cloaks. That must mean you've got some sort of favor with our people. All right, let's have you go talk to this person. Or you killed our people and stole them. Right. Well, there's no holes or blood on them, right? So let's go with the pri- you know, the prior. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a second to breathe that I wouldn't have given someone else. One of the uh, one of the things that I like doing with um, sort of unconventional treasures mm-hmm. is uh, just giving them to the players and seeing what they do with them. Yeah. Um, it may it may not be of anything of obvious value, mm-hmm. uh, but like for instance, one of the things that I've really been loving mm-hmm. is in my game, Erica. Um, you know, I give the the, the art items, yeah. you know, that are like you know a a jewel encrusted goblet or a right. a brass crown of you know with 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 a couple she's collecting the goblets, emeralds so or something there, like yeah. that in there, and like 
instead of taking those and going, wow, this is worth 250 gold. Right. She goes, wow, this is pretty. I put it on. Yeah. And I drink out of the goblet. Exactly. <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm using this. Like, <laughs> And I could just see her character just kind of lounging around in all this stolen jewelry and right. just going like, look at me. I'm fabulous. Exactly. You know? <laughs> no, that totally makes sense. And totally makes sense. I just – I think it's great that, you know, uh, given that, you know, certain characters will become attached to these little trinkets that you throw their way as, mm-hmm. as, as treasures. But then they become like personal possessions. The mugs in my D&D game. Yeah, the mugs. I made I, I made two magical mugs. Basically, they were – were uh, sentient mugs that came out of a weird situation uh, and they weren't – they didn't talk or anything. They were kind of dumb but they had abilities, simple, simple abilities. Their best quality? Their wiggles. They, they they actually would wiggle like you could befriend them and they, they – you made contact with them and they acted like tiny little puppies almost, you know. <laughs> and so uh, – I but it was just something you guys attached to mm-hmm. like and they stuck around. So – but not only can you give good, and I put this out here for a reason, you can give bad. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, generosity can come in a negative form sometimes. There's uh, – Or with consequences, we'll say. Yeah, there's there's things you can slip into your party's pockets that may not be the greatest things for them in the world. Yep. I mean – further inspection. Nine times out of ten, it's sentient. And telling you to do something. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. I mean, I, re- I distinctly remember uh, Chris talking about one of his Shadowrun games where he gave what, the decker of the group a sentient deck. Like it's, the deck was just better mm-hmm. at doing it, at, at running the net because it had AI in it. Well, strangely enough, that thing was plot. Uh-huh. Like it was literally guiding them through and telling them what to do to get it to launch off the planet. <laughs> like pulling all the tricks to eventually get it. I remember him telling the story. And this I'm like, is our, that our is effing episode. brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And I thought that was an effing brilliant uh, design of an item. Yeah. That eventually got its goal taken care of. Right. You but, know. But, and, but that was – I would say that was relatively benign or at least the way he described it was. But, yeah. uh, but, but you know, what, what if you do have that item that's, that's trying to, you know, guide you to nefarious purpose? I mean you brought up – you've got listed on here Craven's Edge. Craven Edge, yes. I um, had to look that up because I thought it was what I thought and it sure as heck was. It like, absolutely was. That, that story is now I would say relatively legendary and has crossed a few bounds outside of uh, Critical Role. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting and – uh, I think it's – it is a good roadmap mm-hmm. for an item uh, that literally gives people, a, OK, here's the history. Mm-hmm. Here's how it was made. This is why it is the way it is. Um, and here's what it did to a player. Yeah. Is it gone? Maybe. Now, for, for those of you who, who don't know. Um, in the, uh, and this is going to get into some uh, season one critical role spoilers so here. Suck it but but I, I feel pretty confident being that it was a couple of years ago that this all yeah, happened. Yeah. And you pretty yeah. much can't be in the critical role fandom without knowing about it. But, and if you're not, you're not literally gaining anything from this. Um, but uh, somewhere along the way, um, they picked up a sword called Craven Edge. Craven Edge is a sentient great sword. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a uh, barbarian, Grog Strongjaw, in their group, played by Travis Willingham. And uh, they decided to give this to him. Um, it was a good weapon. It was a really good weapon. Uh, and it did uh, – uh, it basically, it drank blood. Mm-hmm. Craved you know, it, and in fact. It, it, cra- it craved it. Uh, yeah, so it was – but it, it spoke to him. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when he first, you know, kind of put his hands on the uh, on the on the, the hilt and and decided to, uh, you know, kind of wield it for the first time, he heard this voice going like, you know, are you to be my new wielder? And he's like, Yes. <laughs> and kind of had an awkward conversation with it, which it very crudely and, you know, edgily described that it was, you know, it thirsted for blood mm-hmm. and he must go and slay his enemies so that it may have its thirst slaked. It is hungry. Yep. Always hungry. And yep. he's like, but, you know, 
Grog wasn't really the moral compass of that <laughs> uh, that group. Probably appropriate that he got it. Um, so, you know, Grog was also a kind of a bloodthirsty barbarian in a lot of ways, and he was very much the you know trigger happy Klingon on tactical, if you will. Right. Uh, so he was very into having a sword that was as enthusiastic about bloody battles as he was. Um. And he started realizing that every time he got a kill with this thing, it added one to his strength. Mm. And then when he took a long rest, all of those plus ones went away. And so they were going into a rather difficult situation. Um, and uh, the storyteller had not handed him the other half of the uh, the stat line for the sword, telling him what happened when the thing actually became satiated. Right. And so he had stacked up a bunch of strength at the previous day fighting with some orcs and decided to take it into this dungeon and not rest the night. Right. He stayed up all night on watch specifically so that he would not lose his stacks of strength gain. Right. Took it into this final battle and finally hit the, I think, 25 strength or something like that. Sure. That, you know, the, or the, plus, the, the full plus five or whatever it was that it maxed out at. Right. And uh, the thing grew like a foot and a half in length and started like smoking like black smoke that smoldered off of it. And it started doing like extra D6 or two of necrotic damage every hit. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, oh, my God, why did I not do this earlier? This is amazing. (laughs) And fought through the entire fight like that. Um, They got out of the dungeon. Mission accomplished. Everything was great. And uh, the storyteller leans over and says, uh, make a constitution saving throw. And he failed it. Oh, no. And he took three steps forward and dropped dead. Cold in the snow. Mm-hmm. Like, a sack of pa- like a sack of potatoes. And everybody was like, what the? Because it stole his soul. It got strong enough that it could steal the soul of its wielder. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was an argument that took place with the sword. Right. <laughs> Give it back, you little bugger. Yep. Uh, <laughs> that will break you. Et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it was it was that, um, if you'll pardon the obvious pun, the double-edged sword yep. sort of, you know, he did an amazing job and it granted him all sorts of strength. But in the end, it was only trying to get strong enough to, to, to take him as well. It was gluttonous. And yep. – uh, Looking for gluttony. Yep. And it's, it's a beautiful, dark gift. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you've got situations where people are gifted places like, hey, you guys just uh, cleared out this keep. Uh, I was, you know, full of bad shit. Now it's yours. It's your home base. You've got, you know, they start upkeeping it, Mm -hmm. start discovering things. People start discovering them. Things start coming to them. Yep. Like, oh, now we got merchants showing up here because they know we have money. Mm-hmm. So they come on a regular basis. Oh, we've got bandits who show up to rob the merchants because they know we have money. <laughs> Word gets out that you've gone soft and it's nothing but work, work, work for everybody. <laughs> exactly. 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 <laughs> yep. So uh, things like that can definitely turn around. I remembered uh, one game where basically they got their home base and noted that uh, bad things were happening around them. Like they would – you know, they they would go and take care of a problem at, and then come back to this place that wasn't that far. And like by the next day, someone was saying, oh, this is happening over in the cave over on this side. And they're like, wow, OK. So constant issues would mm-hmm. keep coming up. Come to find out that, uh, yeah, there's a reason why someone left that keep. It's cursed. <laughs> it's a troubled keep. You know, every time there's trouble, it comes closer to the keep because the keep is a nexus of problems. And I quote the Mandalorian when I say, you need to find a new place to live. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Nice, by the way. To- yes. Totally ruining that for people. No, Mandalorian's great. I love it. Oh, I love um, the Mandalorian so far. But again, gifts and curses. Yeah. That that has another one for uh, it. One of the ones that I was that I was thinking back on, it's a uh, mm. the, the 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 good thing that really turns out to be a bad thing pretty mm-hmm. much every single time. Oh. White Wolf. Um, White Wolf Games, uh, Vampire, Werewolf, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, Meiji Apocalypse. Has a uh, a merit <laughs> that is pretty universal, so you don't have to be in any specific genre to uh, right, right. To, to, to pick it up, called True Love. Oh. Now, it is supposed to be like a five-point merit, that, right. which is a lot, um, for those of you who do not know the system. Yep. Um, that uh, 
gives you a source of willpower. You know, you can pull upon your true love. Um, you know, of of whoever this 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 person tends to be, um, or to whatever, you. whether it's whether it's a platonic love or a romantic love, but one right. way or another, you have a loved one that you can use as a source of willpower, right. essentially. Um, however, <laughs> it's instantly like telling the storyteller there's someone who can be kidnapped for instant leverage. Correct. And uh, so, at least in my past gaming groups, we've always called it the true love flaw. Yes. <laughs> or the or the true love curse. Yes. Because uh, it's – Though it is a powerful thing, willpower, mm-hmm. it is a terrible weight to carry. Yep. Because you now have a built-in, statted-out liability attached to your character sheet. Yes. I mean there's other ones like 7C has uh, – actually calls them flaws and like star-crossed mm-hmm. where you just have a problem with falling in love. Yep. Constantly. Oh, God. Does Madeline have that one right now? I don't think so. No. Because if she traded in her – I don't know. We'll figure it out later. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so. uh, yeah. 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 It's a little, that, cause, yeah the love, true love is always the, the, the double-edged sword that just keeps on giving kicks to the nibbly bits. Now, we're going to step away from that. All right. Because there's one thing that we have to talk about as far as generosity when it comes to gaming. The GM bribe. The GM bribe. We've had our fair share of them over the years. All right. So the I've GM bribed bribe. some serious GMs. Let's let's set the table here a little All right. bit. All right. So the GM bribe. Um, now, I, I, you're going to be able to provide a lot more background on this than I will. Sure. Because I, I came into the GM bribe. You did. You okay. did. I'd, I'd like to hear your take on it. Um, so uh, I've mentioned before on this podcast that uh, I met Rob through some mutual friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was invited to Rob's game to join it. Um, pretty much sight unseen. We we met. Um, I was vouched for by this mutual friend as uh, – um, and introduced to the group and allowed to join the join his table quite generously. Um, we hit it off as fast friends, and we've been uh, we've been good friends ever since. Yeah. Um, and that's why you guys have to listen to us for an hour after every week. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, ever since I started attending Rob's game, um, there has been the GM bribe, and that is uh, someone walks in with a tall Slurpee for him. <laughs> And uh, places it in front of him. Um, <laughs> there has been some contention over who can get to the GM bribe first. Yeah. You know, is, is Chris already there? Is he already, is he already at 7-Eleven? And uh, like, oh, yeah, I know. He's already got it. Oh, darn. Oh, darn. All right. Well, I'm going to pick up snacks anyways. Does anybody want anybody? Right. Now, to my knowledge, I, I don't know the origins. Again, this is where I'm going to pass it off back to Rob. But uh, in my time, the GM bribe has always been joked about being a bribe. But there Correct. has never been a an actual – exchange of, you know, goods or favor or anything like that um, in exchange for it. It's just simply been a tongue-in-cheek reference Very to, much so. hey, I picked you up a Slurpee. Yeah. The the history digs farther back with me to pretty much even some of my earliest games. I would say that uh, my, the, the first games that I played didn't have it. Mm-hmm. But there was definitely an air to the GM bribe of um, having those who are running the game – a little more pleasant because we were still dealing in an era where it was you versus the GM yeah, in yeah, many yeah. ways. Um, so bribing the GM meant that you had a little more favor for the night maybe as a group <laughs> and you might survive the evening or whatever the dungeon was. A supplication to the gods. Exactly. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, so my uh, – my thought on that was the GM bribe continued with me when I gamed with Chris. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would, you know, you'd bribe the GM, uh, and his group was about, had that as a carryover thing as well within it. Okay, okay. Uh, so that's kind of just carried through my groups, and I've propagated it other places. I even brought it to Gem, Gen Con, and it was a thing when we were there. We talked about doing the the GM bribe there, and they laughed about it, but everybody knows about it. There's, it's kind of just an uh, if you've been brought up from that era of storyteller or you know storyteller versus players you know or the dm being the master the gm bribe has always kind of just been a thing and i would say even um i mean it carries in with the players like i never asked yeah. for a gm bribe no i really didn't but somewhere along the way i let it out that i like sour gummies yep so it takes sour patch kids just started like pounds of them <laughs> pounds of sour patch kids started showing up at the beginning of my games just waiting in yes. my seat you know yes and so. uh so yeah no i uh 
Yeah, even even the GM bribes go on on my games. So yeah, it, it, it's a thing, and I, I think it it just helps lighten the load for everyone. Because I does. think as storytellers, I appreciate it because it catches me off guard. Because my brain isn't on what are they going to bring me for a bribe. Yeah, my brain is on will I be able to have a good story tonight? Am I going to think in the right frame? You know, are, am I going to be able to entertain? Yeah, sure, absolutely. And when when I get something set before me, like I don't know where I get my. Slurpy, I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Everything's gonna be fine. This is the norm. They're okay. Let's do this thing. It's, like it's I'm a, into it's a way it now. For the players to show that you're among friends and yeah. just relax. This is light at ap- you know ap- atmosphere. But also, um, I think it's just a really nice way to say thank you to the storyteller. Yeah, you know, I mean, you put all this work in. Like as as a player, you just, I mean, you you kind of just have to show up, right? Like that's that's your obligation. Mm-hmm. Bring show up with dice. Bring your a game and listen. And listen, yeah. you know, and and participate well in the story, right? But then, like you're you're on you're on time off until you know until the next storyteller until the next the next story, but but the storyteller's got all this in between stuff. They've got to manage yeah. the campaign. They've got to write the next session. They've got to figure out NPCs and world building and all this jazz that we go on about in our podcast here. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's sometimes it can be like a second job, and so you know, just showing up with like. Hey man, we appreciate what you do for us every every month. Here's a Slurpee or here's a big patch of sour yeah. co- sour patch kids. You and know? it's it's also the players. We are not sponsored by sour patch kids. God no. Or seven uh, no. Uh and you're <clears throat> you made an assumption there. It could have been Meyer. <laughs> well. Uh but uh no, you're right, it's a Slurpee. Um but the the point is is that it's also the players listening to who the storyteller <laughs> Pardon me. Woo. Uh, who the storyteller is and what their likes are and it and it makes that human connection beyond the screen and I think that right there is a huge touch point as well. I think it helps to humanize that it's more than just a storyteller. It's a friend. Yeah. That makes that, and it's personal. It's not just like we're going to bring you a bunch of candy. Like I don't – you know, candy. Like what guys? Like, <laughs> you know. But like if the players know that like when they were there after the first session that he was sitting there with a bag of, you know, Hersey Kishes, you know, setting to the side and he was just cracking them and eating them. Like, oh, he's eating a lot of Hersey Kishes. He's like, does he like those things? Why? Well, you can bring him a bag of those. Like, could, you know, give yeah. him a chalice of them sitting off to the side. Oh. You know, and that's the kind of thing. At that point, you've made a connection uh-huh. with a storyteller and you're moving beyond – the norm of of it just being a job, yeah, and yeah, I think absolutely. that makes a huge difference. So, you want to talk about holidays? Yeah, we can talk about holidays. There's all kinds of holidays. So the question is, is like, do you put them in games? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, that's, that's you the, do. That's the, I know you do. I do because you guys <laughs> created one. I, I made a holiday. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, but you know, I mean, we we play we play games across a lot of a lot of different genres. Yeah, and. Um, I know we're we're kind of running a little short on time here to to, to kind of get in the big holiday we got discussion, a little bit. but um, you know, some of those genres are uh, mirrors of our real real world. I agree, um, and some of them are completely fantasy based. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it's 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 almost two different discussions. Um, and uh, the, the the reason I broached that broached the topic like that mm-hmm. is because uh, I know Knox in the box had uh, uh, one of our Patreon supporters has. Uh, Tossed us a question regarding how we bring holidays into the game simply because there are, you know, you may be sitting at a, at a, a mixed faith or, you know, multicultural table. Oh God, just talking about religion in general. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of, a lot of groups will kind of view it as kind of an off top, you know, uh, an yeah. off. It's a boundary. It's, it's a boundary just yeah. simply because you don't want to, you know, you want to keep things light and you don't want to get into right. heavy sort of discussions. So, well, it can um, feel very personal. You know, so so asking about how you do bring in you know real world holidays and such like that into your game, I, I would assume that's under the premise of if you're playing on an you know uh, an assumed Earth, contemporary Earth, contemporary, or Earth. I mean yeah. semi contemporary, I'll even say. Sure, sure. Um, you know, so I, I again, I think it's a I think it's a two part kind of question. Um, you yeah. know, how do you invent fantasy holidays, and how do you handle real life holidays? I mean, strangely enough, um, a non secular or a non-religious holiday um, that I threw together for the D and D game was the 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 kinging uh, in the goblin realm, or the um, gnome realm, mm-hmm. where it's an event. It, it where the all the tinkers come together, they present, 
a king is chosen among them and they become the king until the next one is chosen in time. Yeah. And it is a holiday. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It is a, a festive event. There's all kinds of stuff involved in it and it doesn't mean that it has to be religious connotation but for them it is religion as far as it changes their daily lives. There's a routine to it. It happens at a certain time every couple sure. of years. You know, you've got harvests. That are non-religious based. Mm -hmm. So if you want to stay away from that, there are definitely times of year that are important oh, yeah, for yeah. harvest, for planting, for things like that. Yeah, even just just from a secular standpoint, because I, I I know um, you know uh, like pagan religions and stuff like that hold yeah. hold uh, you know moon phases and and uh, solstices, equinoxes, and whatnot. Yep. Um, they hold those in in regard, but but those are still you know scientific astronomical. Sure. Uh, occurrences, right. you know, so celebrating the darkest night of the year or the longest day of the year or something right. like that is, um, you know, perfectly viable in a, yep. in a in a secular standpoint. You know, being um, that it is a turning point for the year. When uh, one of the things that during the LARP that we played, age long. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When age the, long. When the elves and the orcs blood rage and they literally fight. Right, because there was a there was a, a blood feud essentially, an yeah. ageless blood feud between the orcs and the elves, yeah. and age long was one of the reasons that it took place it was yeah. literally in their blood to yeah. hate each other yeah during those nights there the the youngest <laughs> of the elves would rage the youngest of the orcs would rage their blood would boil within their bodies and have a need to want to go and slay mm -hmm. and mortal enemies they became and continued yeah. um and it gave a reason for events to occur now if you weren't one of those two groups you were in a hurt locker of trouble being stuck between them you in the dark. got the hell out of the way. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, other problems came from that. When you got a lot of bodies, mm -hmm. you might get some necromancy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Whoops. Whoopsie. Exactly. Um, so things like that can also come from moments. Uh, so uh, races having historical – uh, issues yep. and and or changes, you know, werewolves changing on the moon, kind of a thing, you know. Uh, celebrations of uh, of past victories, mm -hmm. um, like maybe there was a major battle fought on this day, yeah. And you know, the the this this was the day that the you know the peace treaty was signed because, you know, they they finally crushed their foe, yeah. And that is that is when our nation celebrates the victory over the you know whatever other neighboring realm, yeah. Um, it. And, and not everything has to be, uh, you know, has to be, um, um, you know, national or global mm -mm. in any sort of way. Yeah. Um, we have a local holiday that mm -hmm. uh, that that your party created yep. in a small village off the off the Gold Coast of Cyrodiil. Yep. Um, they call it Crush Fall, and they've yep. only ever celebrated it once. Yep. Because it happened about a month ago. <laughs> yep. That it did. That it did. But they will remember that day. Right. But yep. it was it was the day that some heroes came in from the local city of Anvil and mm -hmm. vanquished the, uh, the 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 troll that was terrorizing their village, and it was the most excitement that's happened in that minor little fishing village in all of their memorable lives. Yep. And but you guys are the big darn heroes at the end of the day. Yep. And so they they named they created a holiday. Indeed. Named it Crush Fall after the the fall of Crushmaw the troll. Yep. And uh, you better believe that uh, if we play long enough for the for the in-game calendar to tick back around to uh, uh, 18th of 7th uh, – second seed, mm -hmm. I believe it is the 18th of second seed yep. uh, is when you will be – you will get a summons back to – Yep. Back yep. to the village to, of Solenshore. To, 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 to respond to those days. To be the honored guests at their second annual celebration of Crushfall. Yes, yes. So uh, I think – Kind of to, to to lead into this a bit more, um, I would say that uh, incorporating uh, the idea and the movement of holidays is important for the world setting. But I think if it's important to your plot mm -hmm. uh, and either becomes a, a point of tension, meaning it becomes like an environmental hazard – if yeah, you will, because now there's a ton of people in town when you didn't expect it. Yeah, we we talked a lot about uh, a couple couple weeks ago about environmental yep. hazards. Yep, and now Mardi suddenly... Gras is a huge environmental hazard. <laughs> I'm just going to say that right now. Depends on how many beads you have, my friend. Right, uh, but likewise, you could have your group come into a town that basically is having Poochki Day. Now I'm saying this because we have international people who have no idea what I just said. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. effectively. That's donut eating day, especially for, for those of us of Polish descent in in the Michigan area. Yeah, uh, that's it because it is not 
really popular very far and wide. You you, you kind of – people know of it, but they don't always get to celebrate it, which but is sad. Here in Detroit, we have yeah. Hamtramck, we have which Hamtramck. is one of the largest Polish populations mm-hmm. in all of America. Yep. And uh, so uh, – but th- imagine, imagine if a group of adventurers came into a town that was having Punchki Day. Uh-huh. You know, it's and, – and honestly, it's the day – you know, it's just before uh, fasting that they do for something else. Yep. You know, maybe maybe that has nothing to do with religion, but it might have a lot to do with a, a, a race or something that has to happen, you know, mm-hmm. that happens to a capital. So this town, which has created the best runners, know that they do these things in this order. So they created this this day of feast. And, and, and sometimes these things happen organically too, mm-hmm. you know. At first, you've just got some people doing the smart thing, which right. is this particular physical regimen to prepare them for this thing that they need to do. Yep. It's totally secular. It's totally not – it's not a holiday. Nope. It's just a thing we're doing to prepare because we're professionals, darn it. Yep. And then other people catch on. And yep. then over years, it becomes ritualized yep. where you start doing this. And and that ritual then kind of turns into more people doing it. But maybe they don't quite understand the full history of it. They yep. don't understand the whole thing. And they start adding fun little things to it to kind of gamify it. And it becomes a um, celebration. And then – Oh, my gosh. I was just remembering. Yeah. There's uh, There was a d and uh, story that I'm remembering from my past where nobles – uh, once or yeah, once a year would mask themselves and come down the streets. Oh. And as they came down the streets, they would throw gifts. Oh, interesting! Out to the people, uh, masked and completely different. Okay, so okay. you wouldn't know if it was the prince, the king, a duke, could be anyone. Yeah, sure. But everyone who was anyone would come down. So for them. It, they knew who each other were, mm-hmm. and so it was all about the pageantry of of being like a Mardi Gras. Person. Only Lord Pendleton would wear such a ostentatious mask. And at the same time, you'd have <laughs> men wearing women's outfits, when women wearing men's outfits. Sometimes they would pick a theme, and they'd all look like gods, uh-huh. or they would all look like you know uh, ancient warriors or whatever. But the people slowly joined. Mm-hmm. You know, they would wear masks as. Uh, looking like the nobles, trying to make themselves and therefore gain extra favor. Mm -hmm. But adventurers coming into a town and seeing everyone masked for like three days and a parade that happened every day that everyone came to. Mm -hmm. Nobles and and like the court doesn't exist. No one's in court. Yeah. Because it's parade time. Yeah. And like they're saying like, I'm sorry, I can't meet with you right now. Why? I have to go to the parade. Why? If I don't, I'm going to lose my station, mm-hmm. you know, and suddenly there's a murder at the parade. Yeah. Who died? How did it happen? Who killed who? And and now there's a whole event wrapped around this secular event that was meant to be joyous. And, yeah. And it's changing the city because now like do we do a parade tomorrow? And of course, you know. The king is like, of course, we have to keep this going. And meanwhile, like, I'm not going to go down there. I'm not, I'm not going to get killed. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so you've, got, you've got that whole change up that happens. So things like that can definitely add a flavor to your world and to the plot and make things way more challenging in ways that you wouldn't normally do it. Yeah, absolutely. So. All right. So what about real world uh, 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 holidays? Like incorporating them? Yeah. Well, I mean, Seventh C gonna... is almost a semi-real world. Well, let's 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 talk literally but... contemporary. Okay, okay. So uh, mm-hmm. let's let's just go. You know, either D and D modern, uh, vampire, d- sh- vampire. Sure, vampire is a perfect va- example. Vampire. Sure, sure. It, so so how how do you handle with sensitivity mm-hmm. adding in a a an event which may be of significant spiritual personal. Um, sort of, uh, you know, how do you handle that well, um, especially if you have a multicultural table? I think it depends on the, the characters, okay. not the players necessarily, but the characters and how much you want to incorporate it. Uh, a good example, Home Alone. Mm-hmm. It's Christmas. Christmas is a setting. There isn't – it is a, a feeling of hope. And mm-hmm. generosity that sits behind a curtain of stress and concern, mm-hmm. darkness and light in 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 vast change, where you have these these beautiful dazzling lights on a rich street, and and darkness coming into it. Mm-hmm. You know, you have thievery, 
but you, you have a church and carols being sung, you know, but you're not specifically stating in any one of those scenes, you're not discussing the religious aspects mm-hmm. of the thing. You're you're taking the secular community of it. Yep. Because there was a boundary set there. They mm-hmm. didn't want to ruin they didn't want to ruin it by forcing it in a specific area because that wasn't the story. Sure. The sure. story wasn't about the faith. I'm now I'm now imagining Home Alone as an hour of a storyteller saying, make a deception check, followed by an hour of saying, make a duck save. <laughs> Roll for disadvantage. <laughs> right. <laughs> You've been hit in the face with, an, with a hot iron. Roll yeah. at disadvantage. Yes. Yes. Uh, but that's the kind of thing is that you have to kind of take yourself back to shows that don't focus on the religion, that the character might, but the, the overall plot and movement of the story doesn't weigh itself on that. It looks at the setting that is that. Yeah, I, I I agree. Um, I think, you know, if if it is important to your story, um, I think it's okay to delve into some of those things. I don't see um, why not. Uh, you know, obviously you want to you you want to treat it with with compassion and sensitivity as well, mm-hmm. though. Um, you know, and I would say if you do have, um, a firsthand uh reference for that, you know, specifically like okay, if if you have a Jewish person sitting at your table, ask them. How they celebrate Rosh Hashanah, you know, yeah, and, Sabbath, or, like that. Yeah. exactly, you know, and get that input directly from them so that you know what's important, what might be taboo about it and stuff sure. like that. So if it does become important to your story or a character in your story that, that may be, you know, celebrating that holiday, that you can at least do it justice and focus on the important things and not fall into stereotypes um, you know, and and verge on racism that you know you you don't intend. Right, and if it's going to be in your story, and you're you're going to be working on it, make sure people are aware. Yep. You know, walk that line and be willing to accept that you made a mistake. Yeah, absolutely. You know that. Oh, okay, that wasn't an accurate way of handling that. I will be better at that. You know. And I I think the important thing for everybody to to to, to remember, um, whether you're a storyteller or a player, is that, you know, uh, operate in good faith. Yeah. Um, go into this with the you know we we've talked before about assuming everybody at the table is friends, you know, and carry that assumption into things like this too. Always. Where you want to assume that you know if if you if I did make a gaffe in representing your religion or your your particular celebration, um, that it was that it was out of ignorance, not malice, right? And that I really had the best intentions. Please educate me on this so that I can do it better next time. Yep. Just be be kind on all sides. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I think we have two questions we can wrap in. And well, then... one one of them is Knox in the box, and we kind oh, of that's we, true. We, we I think really we just kind of that. answered that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Overwatch has what's a campaign or setting that you've had kicking around for a while but never actually run? Oh, too many to count. So many questions. Too many to count. The problem with being a storyteller, especially a more or less full time storyteller like you and I are, mm-hmm. is that. We just idly come up with ideas all the time because that's just what our brains are doing because we're so practiced at it. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, Adventure, mm-hmm. I ran a couple game sessions of it. I, I want you to go back to it. Huge success. Unfortunately, happened at a really trying time in my life and I've not been able to return to it. And uh, we've just been playing other games. Yeah. Um, so I would say Adventure is the game I've never run because I didn't really give it breathing room. I, I, yeah. Two two sessions is not running it. No. It's four. We made the hard rule that four is when you have a campaign. Yep. Um, I kind of always wanted to now, – now that I know that I know what I'm doing, I kind of want to go back and run um, After the Bomb. Ha. Uh, to the the, the – Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangenesses, uh, everybody is a mutant worldwide setting yeah. after the bomb. Yeah. I, I, I got all the books for it. Mm-hmm. They're old. The spines are cracked on them. But gosh darn it. That was my first system. Yeah. It's got a special place in my heart. And now that I know what I'm doing as a storyteller, there's a part of me that would really like to go back and run it again. Um, I like the concept of Robotech. And I, I like the – cartoony heroic edges of it mm-hmm. it's, it's one of the reasons why i really love 7c um I, I got to run my one shot and it was fun and it gave me some flavor on where things could go with that and it it was it was fun um 
But I honestly miss Vampire. I miss Dark Ages. Yeah. I have ideas wrapped in that. I would love to do something like that again. But I don't really know the system well enough anymore. I've lost yeah. it. Yeah. And But I could come back to it. So Speaking of, speaking of White Wolf, I, I've, I've really always wanted to run Mage the Ascension. Ah, challenging never, fun. Never had a time. I never had a chance to. All right. So next week's topic, we are going to be here on the first talking about what you want to hear. We'll uh, be live. Yes, we we'll will be, be live. live. So uh, hopefully we will we will be watching all channels on Discord uh, and have a few of you listening in with us so we can uh, we can answer questions live, but we can also get some questions from you and uh, hear some more of what how your year went. Tell us how what you, what you got that was gaming related for Christmas and uh, present to us some ideas that you have for the new year so that yeah. maybe we can all step into it with something fresh and creative and fun. Tell us what you're looking forward to, you know, to the challenges ahead of you. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Anyways, you can find us on Twitter at ST underscore Conclave. You can also find us on Instagram, ST underscore Conclave. You can also find us on Discord. Uh, the link in uh, to our Discord is uh, in our Twitter. Uh, it's a pinned tweet on our on our feed. And you can also find it in the description of every single uh, episode of the podcast that we do here. We always put it up there. Uh, we'd like to thank our Patreon members, uh, all of you who support us all through this adventure this year, and hopefully will continue with us into the new year. Honestly, your love and support is the best gift you could have given us. It's wonderful. It really is. And thank you, Knox, for uh, for kicking an extra for us uh, and uh, helping us make this year a little bit easier. Uh, our intro music tonight is uh, was Christmas on an Island by uh, Junior85, and what you're hearing now is Happy Holidays from Vortex. Uh, both can be found at freemusicarchive.org. We record every week at Podcast Detroit. You can find them online at podcastdetroit.com, on Twitter at Podcast Detroit, and our engineer is the lovely Caitlin. I want to thank you again for uh, for supporting us. Our families, Vicky and Sean, all of our friends who've played with us uh, throughout the years uh, to give us this experience, and you, our listeners. We love you. Good night, everybody. And happy